change, as you say, is often very stressful, positive change. And by that, I mean change that a person decides to make, they decide for themselves to make rather than negative change, which is something foist upon someone. Positive change, that type of positive change is less stressful and often is the result of thinking and evaluation. Now, institutions which educate and foster development, i.e. progress, are often hotbeds of change. The thought of stagnating and refusing to change is a recipe for digression, erosion, socially and individually. The point here I'm trying to make is that unrest on college campuses is actually a positive sign that thinking and evaluation is happening. Unfortunately, the desire to implement change immediately can sometimes result in destructive actions. The bottom line for me is that the agitation at Kane University speaks quite positively for Kane University and also the fact that they took some action to actually do something. It sounds from what you have said to me uh, that uh, Dr. Proctor had a particular penchant for listening. He certainly did. Um, he just had a way in a very benign, very relaxed manner, encouraging dialogue and respectful debate and, and looking at things from another person's point of view. Sometimes the smallest things would demonstrate what I call this man's commitment to finding the best in everyone. There's one very trivial incident that sums that whole idea up for me. I know about it because I was personally involved in it. A few months after we'd met in March of 1996, I was getting ready to go to Dr. Proctor's class on world religions. Now, those of you that knew Kane University in those days, when it wasn't quite as big as it is now, well, remember there was a building where the history and English departments were at that time called Willis Hall. It's since been demolished. Unfortunately, the elevator in that building didn't always work. Now, as you know, I'm a wheelchair user with cerebral palsy, and I could not get the elevator going, and I had to make alternative arrangements because I didn't want to miss the class. I'm a little stiff now at 50, but this was back when I was in my early 20s, so I could move a lot quicker. With the help of my beloved late grandfather, Robert Rowe, I maneuvered my wheelchair over to the stairs and then slowly began to maneuver myself up that flight of stairs. Um, not always an easy thing to do, but I was pulling myself, using my hands and hips to pull my entire body up. And Dr. Proctor was coming down the stairs. He happened to see me, so he gave me a hand to get first my physical person and then the chair at, to the top of the stairs. It was an ordinary act of kindness. He didn't make any production out of it. He just did it. So what, what impressed me, though, was what happened next. I thanked him, got back into the chair, and was about to go on my way into the class when he said, you know, I'm very impressed. You didn't have an obvious difficulty, like a broken elevator, something everybody would have understood if you couldn't have made it, stop you from taking the class. And that hit me like a bolt of lightning. This man saw the effort I was undertaking what it meant to me to be part of the, that academic institution still does. It's very dear to me. Beyond the degree, the job, the other purposes for being educated, interacting in that way is something that I've enjoyed from the earliest part of my existence. I feel a sense of community in academia. I am with people that respect me, that do not discredit me, do not humiliate me with condescending pity, but value my contributions. And to me, that was a symbol of what that 
man Dr. Proctor was. He, he saw the best in people. He believed that with encouragement, people would do the right thing. Samuel DeWitt Proctor was born July 13, 1921, in Norfolk, Virginia. His parents, Don B. Hughes and Herbert Proctor, were pioneer graduates of a unique educational institution called the Norfolk Mission College. It was a combination of high school and what we now call a junior college today. Dr. Proctor's grandmother is a legendary figure. Addie Proctor was a former slave who earned a master's degree in 1874. Ten years out of being a house cook in slavery, this woman earned a master's degree from the Hampton Institute. That's the college that Union General Samuel Armstrong founded. It's probably most well known today for being a college Booker T. Washington studied at. Hattie, Hattie's former owner financed her education as a gesture of moral repentance for being a slaveholder at the end of the Civil War. So just as an aside uh, to amplify what you were saying uh, dr Deneen, you've mentioned to me several of your uh, fellow professors that you just have obviously immense respect for i'm wondering if you want to just take a second and give a shout out to those people they deserve it oh thank you dr weaver that'd be my pleasure I want to pay tribute to my dear mentor and friend, Dr. Jan Balakian, who has guided me since I was an undergraduate in 1996 with an almost maternal level of guidance and encouragement. Dr. Christopher Bolito, the head of the Kane University History Department. Dr. Jonathan Mercantini, our dean. And, and several people have retired my old mentor, Dr. Mark Lender, the great Revolutionary War historian, Dr. Jay Spaulding, who stimulated my interest in African and Islamic history. These men and women took a lot of time, even outside of the classroom, to mentor and encourage me, not by watering down standards, but by helping me to realize that I had the ability to achieve great things in this world if I was willing to put in the effort. Indeed. And it speaks well for the university, too. Um, and, you know, I have, uh, because of my association with you, I have kind of looked at a lot of different things about Kane. You have to say, I'm really impressed with your president. Oh, yes, indeed. He's done absolutely wonderful things. He wants to have us become a research-focused university, which is a passion of my mine too. And he, he's established new departments, possibly even another campus. It has really made a, a wonderful, welcoming environment. Not that it wasn't before, but he's made a special effort to encourage a more diverse student body to give students help without taking away the responsibility for them doing the work but to give hands up rather than hands out and encourage an atmosphere of mutual respect and intellectual joy. To kind of put it in the common vernacular, the dude's got some good vision. He does. <laughs> Anyhow, getting back to Proctor, why did Dr. Proctor take up a role as a minister and a civic leader. These seem to be somewhat different paths, one being spiritual, moral, and the other being political, social. I know that there were multiple leaders and multiple points of view. Well, I don't, he never spoke of it directly, but my best guess is, just as many people say, there's a crossover between the two paths. Many of the leaders of the African-American community in and outside the civil rights movement came out of the clergy of all denominations and spiritual leaders felt compelled to act because they felt not acting to protect the rights of others to 
live up to the best traditions of American society would go against their morality and their humanity. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. Given Proctor's impetus to foster morality, humanity, and the highest ideals of democracy, he probably felt compelled, compelled to act. I assume that he understood that he needed some standing and education uh, to reach those kinds of, of pretty lofty goals, actually, particularly at that time. Uh, do you have any information on his background that might indicate that my assumption is correct? I do, and you are entirely correct. Dr. Proctor earned his bachelor's from Virginia Union University in Richmond. Um, he married his wife, Elizabeth Tate, the wife of, they were married for 55 years, and just after graduation. He later obtained a master's and from Virginia Union also, and a doctorate in theology from Crozer University in Massachusetts. Virginia Union remained very dear to his heart. He served as a professor of moral theology between 1947 and 1949, a dean from 1952 to 1955, and at 36 years old in 1955, was appointed president of the university. He kept that job for five and a half years until 1960. Wow. So while working at Virginia Union, terrible event happened, both to Dr. Uh, Proctor and personally and to the university when the evil perversion of pseudo-Christianity called the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross outside his window. What makes this abhorrent event even more disgusting is that Virginia had a strong opposition to KKK activities, especially after Reconstruction and Depression eras. Uh, and I know this pretty much for a fact. It is unjust beyond all reason to ascribe to the majority of Southern people these sorts of horrible and abhorrent views. Dr. Proctor, like Robert Smalls before him, stood up unafraid against rac racism and oppression. Proctor went out and confronted these bigots face to face and the KKK left. <laughs> it's interesting to note that bullies like the KKK and even some politicians of today actually behave like the cowards they are when they are faced by someone actively taking a positive moral stance. Okay, I'll stop preaching now. Uh, you can take a look at our Smalls podcast for some some other information and, then, and another fascinating story about that. I couldn't agree more. Um, Dr. Proctor went to the Crozier Theological Seminary because he wanted to understand Christianity in the modern world. And that is where he made the acquaintance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself. They bonded over the works of an American theologian and a resistor to the Nazi movement, who was actually a friend of Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, the great Valkyrie resistance leader, Dr. Reinhold Nybar. Now, Nybar is a fascinating character. He combines religious orthodoxy with a strong commitment to racial and social justice. And it was called Christian realism in those days. And what fascinated me, uh, Boston University put out a collection of Dr. King's correspondence uh, right after the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 till his death 13 years later. And it really pleasantly surprised me. There are letters, a great many letters between Dr. King and Dr. Proctor. There are actually 40 letters between 1955 and 1967. And I was very impressed with the fact that the main areas they agreed on were the strong 
political and moral necessity for a nonviolent approach to civil rights and what they called a living faith in which spiritual leaders were unafraid to express their personal views on vital issues. You know, I know that there is an argument of concerning just how much involved in secular affairs believers, much less clergy, should have uh, in uh, secular uh, uh, and political affairs. Some wish to actively influence the world around them for better. Others believe it is important to remain passive and focus on personal improvement, prayer, and waiting on God's own time. I think it is true that faith in action is more morally reasonable. Religious leaders certainly have the right to point out the humanitarian and ethical considerations of their faith. On the other hand, it is difficult to base many moral arguments on foundational documents of any religion. Just as an example, the Bible does not say slavery is wrong. However, religions evolve and the basic notions of freedom and racial equality is supported by most religions, including Christianity, today. Clearly, these were the kinds of things that these two men should raise. Now, Dr. King and Dr. Proctor strongly wanted the support of the National Baptist Convention, which was the uh, largest African-American church organization in the country actively working in the civil rights arena. The convention at that time was under the leadership of Dr. James Jackson, a special correspondent of the FBI and an associate of Chicago political boss, Richard Daly Sr. Jackson believed in civil rights, but wanted to work within political channels. He made himself indispensable to white patrons, then bargained for greater support for the cause of racial justice. Now, Dr. Jackson was strongly opposed to civil disobedience. Instead, he favored petitioning the government and the business oriented approach of Whitney Young's Urban League in obtaining civil rights. Lauren Martin's The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover details the FBI's partnership with uh, conservative African-American clergy like Jackson and Methodist Bishop Archibald Carey Jr. Carney advanced so far in the director's favor uh, that he earned a recommendation to become the first African-American member of the Anti-Communist Subversive Activities Control Board. It's fascinating to me that even within a universally desired cause of civil rights, there are wheels within wheels, factions, bargains, all sorts of interconnected relationships. But one of the important arguments um, that Dr. Proctor and Dr. King expressed is the, vo the value of a self-directed life. It basically means God expects people to, to do what they can for themselves and not blindly wait for miraculous solutions. Men like Dr. Proctor certainly believed in sacrifice and prayer, but they understood their own level of responsibility to improve the world. The Almighty, however we understand them to be, does not expect humankind to abrogate responsibility for their actions or use religious faith to replace reality. I know, Dr. Weaver, that you like to use an example sometimes that a person with blind faith would simply blindfold themselves and walk across the street. This is even mentioned in the Bible and the Temptations of Christ when it says, do not put the Lord to the test. Dr. Proctor was too sincere a believer to see God as a Santa Claus figure granting wishes or a micromanager of individual daily life. 
He worked with Dr. King to secure the Progressive Baptist Convention presidency for a compatriot of his named Dr. Gardner Taylor. Dr. Taylor was another hidden leader and a dear friend of the Howard University president, Dr. James Nabrit. Dr. Nabrit was an advisor to Justice Thurgood Marshall during the Brown case, and also to our friend, Dr. Charles Duncan, who is the subject of another podcast. Dr. Proctor engaged in 20 odd years of travel and political work between 1966 and 1987, he traveled all over the world. He preached in the Soviet Union alongside Reverend Billy Graham, no less, as well as the Orthodox Archbishop Ivan Kos, and appeared as Vice President Humphrey's personal representative in Kenya and later on in Israel. Dr. Proctor in the mid-60s also engaged in service in the Peace Corps, being the director of the Nigerian branch. He felt that embodied faith in action. He reported directly to President Kennedy's brother-in-law, Vice Presidential Candidate Sergeant Shriver. He felt the African people were rightfully determined to uphold their own way of life, adopting the best of the Western world ideas while maintaining their own culture and the best of their own traditions. In 1969, an important event happened when Dr. Proctor replaced Congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. as pastor of the legendary Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York. He served as senior pastor for 20 years, during which he inaugurated a literacy and a breakfast program, found employment for 200 prisoners, and served on three national committees. I'm just moved at this man who advised presidents from Eisenhower to Clinton, took the time to make ordinary people, everyone in fact, aware of their own value. I draw great personal strength from one particular encounter. I did not know this, but when Dr. Proctor passed, died in 1997, he had left instructions with his successor, I can't imagine why, the successor to Reverend Calvin Butts, that I should be told if he died. I, I regretted not being able to get to New York and, and be at the funeral, but he's remained in my prayers and thoughts ever since. This spiritual giant took the time to care for me, as well as everyone else around him. It is truly remarkable that he cared for all people, especially those not famous or not well-known. It conjures up awareness and thoughts of Christ-like service to all of humankind. It was a spur to improvement. Throughout the years, I've learned the really brilliant and giving men and women I've worked with possess a warmth and a humbleness which gently demands those around them rise to new levels of acceptance and achievement. People are better when people they respect encourage what Lincoln called the better angels of their nature. It's very easy to stand there, point fingers, criticize, but it is far more effective in the long run to make necessary suggestions, point out errors when necessary, but to do it in a welcoming manner and to give encouragement for a better outcome next time. Dr. Proctor had an unparalleled talent for getting beyond the ordinary to the depths of every person he encountered. He was confident that there was a divine spirit of ability and love present in all of us, and I'm a better man for the association I had with him. Thank you, my friends, for listening to this. Um, it's very personal to my heart, and I think it sums up the point of this podcast indirectly. We are looking at men and women who under great stresses and difficulties, most of the time, made the world a better place. I think it's it's an encouragement and an example for all of us. Indeed. Well, listen, um, once again, we do thank you for listening. And we hope that you will join us again. We have some really good things coming up. And stay tuned because we're very soon to have the inaugural 
uh, History Twists uh, podcast up and going. In the meantime, hey, give us a like. Leave a comment. We sure enjoy reading them. And they're, they're often very helpful. And thanks again. Bye for now. Bye, friends.